So we're going now to Phil Zimbardo, uh, Professor Emeritus at Stanford. Um, might almost use the term a legendary psychologist, actually. Um, Phil has a book out which we actually haven't cited here for some reason. We do have the Lucifer effect out. No, I'm gonna, I'm but, gonna but you've got to, you're going to you're going to do some, some nice self promotion. That'll be good. Like yeah. everybody else did. So yeah. you should. And and we're going to sign books at, during lunch. Yeah, well, we know about that. So okay, hey, I get his new work is on time. He also did. You probably know this, the Stanford Prison Experiments, and then some. Okay. Some work on the detainee, the uh, episodes at Abu Ghraib as well. But right, start the clock, please. 30 seconds, studio. Keep it quiet, please. Send down. It's about time. End sequence. Take one. 15 seconds, studio. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, Uh, so I'm going to talk about how uh, your perspective on life is governed by something you're unaware of, namely your sense of time perspective. Time perspective is the study of how we partition the flow of our e everyday experiences into time zones, into categories. And we do it automatically uh, and typically mindlessly. These time frames, these biases vary between c cultures, social class, and individuals. The main thing I'm going to focus today is how, how they become biased. They become biased because we overuse some frames and underuse others. I'm going to argue that time perspective is one of the most powerful influences on all of human behavior and even national destinies. Uh, and uh, in the book uh, I'm going to sign this afternoon, uh, which just came out recently, uh, we're talking about how um, uh, through research that I've done over 30 years and developing a scale that measures uh, differences in time perspective, we can make some interesting predictions which I'll share with you today. So the paradox number one is, if time perspective exerts such a profound influence on all behavior, how come we're unaware of it? We meaning ordinary people, but also psychologists. It's not a topic in any index of any introductory psych text or any, any cognitive psych text that I know about. Um, so your life is filled with decisions every day. Basic one, since the time you were a child, should you work or play? Should you study, go out with friends? Should you drink more wine before, before driving home? Should I eat more sweets, even though I know I'm a diabetic? Should I practice safe sex or just do it? Should I smoke more now and risk cancer later? Uh, should I go for high yield, high risk loans versus low, real, low yield, low risk? Uh, should I vote for Obama, risk more national uh, disasters? Should I, <laughs> should I give in to temptation or should I delay gratification? Uh, but how does your time perspective influence these and other decisions you make every day? So the simple model I've developed is you have to make a decision and on base of that decision you're going to take an action. For some people, the only influence on their behavior is the immediate situation. They're stimulus bound. That is, what does it smell like? What does it taste like? What does it feel like? They're socially bound. What are other people in the situation doing? And they're, they're physiologically bound. What are my hormones telling me? What is my oxytocin telling me? If you are the kind of person for whom your decisions are based in that immediate setting, we're going to call you present-oriented. For other people, the present is irrelevant. Every decision is anchored in the past. When have I been in a situation like this in the past? What have I done? Did it work? Did it not done work? I'm going to bring that into the present. We're going to call those people past-oriented. On the other hand, there's a third person making the same decision and for them, the present is irrelevant, the past is irrelevant. It's all about anticipated consequences. It's about cost-benefit analysis. And these people are going to call future-oriented. The past and future are the same in the sense that they are abstractions. They don't exist, except we reconstruct them. I'm going to talk about these as if they were types, but in fact, it's a continuum. Uh, on the scale I've developed, which I'll describe in a minute, uh, you get scores of uh, the degree to which you are past, present, or future oriented. So we're going to get four-year-old kids. We're going to give them an emotional cognitive dilemma. They're gonna, they're gonna, we're playing a game, and they win the game, and they can have a marshmallow now, but if they wait, they can have two. So there's a bird in the hand where two in the bush. Do you delay gratification and get the big reward? If you like, if you like one, you, two is going to be better. And I'm calling this impulsive versus reflective action, present versus future orientation. 
It's a study done years ago by Walter Michel that, that we've just updated. And on the basis of that simple decision, it has enormous consequences on your whole life. So here's a little animation I just made about that study and the implications. You may already be familiar with the famous marshmallow study conducted by my colleague, psychologist Walter Michel, in which a group of four-year-olds were given one marshmallow and told they were allowed to eat it immediately. They were told that if they could wait to eat the marshmallow after being left alone with it for a while, then they would be given an extra marshmallow to eat. Most eat the marshmallow as soon as they are left alone with it, but some other children are able to resist temptation. Those children who ate the marshmallow right away are considered to be oriented toward the present, while those who resisted temptation have an orientation toward the future. When the children were interviewed years later as 18-year-olds, there were amazing differences between the children who were able to delay gratification and those children who couldn't resist the immediate temptation. Scored 250 points higher on the SAT, overreacts to frustration, works well under pressure, indecisive, self-reliant and confident, prone to jealousy and envy. The Marshmallow Experiment is a classic study of how a person's ability to delay gratification, even at the age of four, can predict many significant future outcomes. But what does this have to do with you? A lot. In my new book, The Time Paradox, you will learn how your own relationship to time plays a significant role in your personal happiness. Whether you're looking for a better understanding of the world at large, from religion to politics to business to national destinies, or want a deeper understanding of yourself, the Time Paradox teaches you how to recognize your own attitudes toward time and how your everyday decisions are influenced by your personal time orientation. And it will help you overcome the hidden mental biases that keep you too attached to the past, unhealthily obsessed with future goals, but too focused on immediate gratification. You can improve your personal success, happiness, and psychological health. The time paradox will show you how. It's only a matter of time, making time work for you. OK. So one of the reasons you're, <laughs> thank you. One of the reasons you're unaware that, that you have this bias is that it starts very young. It's influenced by all of these things. I'm going to mention a few later on. Culture, geography, the closer you live to the equator, we're at an environment that uh, things don't change, you're likely to be present-oriented. Religion, I'll talk about that in a minute. Social class, educational level. Uh, each of these things contributes. So it's over-determined, uh, but I'm going to argue that it is modifiable. There are six time perspective factors. You can fo people who focus on the past but well, we've discovered there's two ways. You can focus on, you can bring the positive things or the negative things from the past into the present. You can be focused on, you can be um, from the past into the present. You can be present oriented by being present hedonistic, wanting, you know, sex roll, sex, rock, drugs, rock and roll, or present fatalistic, meaning it doesn't pay the plan, nothing ever works out. You can be future oriented, namely goal seeking, or you can be transcendental future, namely life begins after death, as for many people in various religions. Um, the thing we have not focused on is the Zen now, the holistic, expansive present. So an in-depth look. So you take the scale. Uh, it's called Zambara Time Perspective Inventory. Uh, and it's on the website, timeparadox.com. You can take it, score it, uh, get your profile. And essentially, there are questions like this. It gives me pleasure to think about my past. I like family rituals and traditions that are repeated regularly. If you, if, you, if you say that's characteristic of me, you're going to be high on past positive. On the other hand, I've taken my share of abuse and rejection in the past. You're going to be high on past negative. Uh, present hedonists respond, I do things impulsively. I try to live as fully as possible one day at a time. The present fatalist says, yes, fate determines much of my life. Um, and so the present hedonists to do things impulsively. They make decisions on the spur of the moment. There are no to-do lists. They like to gamble. Uh, we find even at Stanford, these kids don't wear wristwatches. Uh, I believe that a person's day should be planned ahead each morning, meeting tomorrow's deadlines, doing other necessary work, comes before tonight's play. I'm able to resist temptations when I know this work can be done. This is future time perspective. This is what probably most of us in this room are high on. Um, and so they have a t their to-do list uh, are endless. Uh, and they resist temptation. So here's a modern version of Adam and Eve in, 
in an in-flight magazine. Here's Eve trying to tempt this guy to put down his attache case to come and play. But he's not going to go for the marshmallow. He's going to resist. Uh, in the Moscow Cemetery, here's this statue of this guy. It's visiting on the phone making one more call. <laughs> <laughs> So, so everyone gets five scores, and we relate them to a whole series of, of other tests of other uh, traits. Um, now, you know in psychology, studies of individual difference are typically on the order of correlation of 0.2 or 0.3. What I want you to see is the enormously high correlations. So this is, if you're high in future time perspective, it's 0.70 on conscientiousness. We're going to see why this is really important, because it's linked to longevity. Prefer consistency, 0.6, high on ego control, also high on energy impulse control, but low. They don't seek sensation, they're low on aggression, uh, low on, on depression. If you're past positive, it's a totally different profile. You're happy, you have positive self-esteem, you're friendly, there's some energy, some creativity, but low on anxiety, depression, and aggression. If you're present hedonistic, look at this picture. 0.70 on novelty seeking, on sensation seeking, high energy, but also high aggression, but high creativity. Ego under control, 0.75. There's almost no correlation in all of psychology that's higher than that. Prefer consistency, no. Impulse control, no. Conscientiousness, no. Emotional stability, no. The sad uh, features, and these are people, these are these are all functioning college students. It's a sample of 205 college students, College of San Mateo. If you're high present fatalistic, high on aggression, high on anxiety, high on depression. Low on concern for the future, 0 0.70. They don't care about the future. Uh, low on self-esteem, conscientious energy, emotional stability, and happiness. Equally terrible is past negative. Look at this triad. Anxiety, depression, aggression, 0 0.60 to 0 0.75. And low on self-esteem, emotional stability, impulse control, happiness, energy. So the second paradox is each of those in the extreme, past positive, hedonism, and future, have, have positive things about it, but the, the negatives in the extreme outweigh them. So for example, if you pass positive, what's great about it is you're happy, self-esteem, patriotic, gratitude, high in wisdom. They, these are the family valued people, and they have a sense of personal identity over time. The present-oriented hedonists, they're high affiliates, they take joy in life, they high sensuality, high sexuality, high energy. They are the people who improvise, they, they explore novelty. If you're future-oriented, high achievement, high self-efficacy, they have a high focus on health, uh, they do probability thinking, cost-benefit analysis, they have positive expectancies, and they have hope for change. What's negative about these is, if you're past negative, these are the people who experience trauma, guilt, depression, retaliation, revenge. At a national, they resist change. So in a world, a globalized world, if you have a large number of people who are past negative, you're not going to be equipped for change. This is one of the problems with Italy, we talked about earlier. Uh, but also, these are the people who, who have blood revenge hundreds of years later about your great-grandfather attacked my great-grandfather. Uh, if you're present hedonist, what's terrible about it is you are at risk for all addictions. You make risky actions. You're, you're motivated by violence and anger. You gamble. You, these are the people running up credit card debts. And they believe you make gains by luck, not by effort. What's wrong with, with us future-oriented people? We're too anxious, we worry too much, we're so relatively socially isolated, uh, competitiveness is too high, and we have research to show that it increases sexual impotence, especially among men. John McCain, I want to argue, stuck in a past negative time perspective regarding the Iraq war. What does that mean? It means that he focuses on the failure to win the Iraq war and the suffering he experienced. He said this in his debate. And he argues we must continue this war until we win, even if it takes 100 years. What he does not understand, this is a new war. This is an asymmetrical conflict. A terrorist war is asymmetrical. It's not a nation against another nation. Therefore, you cannot win a war in which there is no one to surrender. It's the definition of winning a war. Someone must surrender. You're not dealing with a nation state. You're dealing with a network of individuals. So we've done research putting, looking at both correlational research and experimental research, looking at health in Italian women, women in Rome who are future-oriented, much more likely to go to free, uh, free breast cancer clinic testing, uh, conservation and sustainability in Brazil and Mexico, people who are future-oriented are much more likely to endorse and actually put into action uh, conservation measures. Uh, college grades at Stanford, the more future-oriented you are, the higher your grades. I'm going to show a study quickly about solving mazes. Uh, who takes risks, smoke, <laughs> smoke uh, and, and drugs, we'll see. 
The scale is going around the world. There are 22 translations now with dozens of researchers. And the amazing thing is that in every single country uh, that people have used this, they're getting significant results. Does it predict maze solving? We're going to take present-oriented versus future-oriented students, and we're going to ask them to solve some mazes, half men, half women. Uh, and very simply, they solve mazes like this. We say begin. If you're future-oriented, you don't begin. You look. You look at the goal. You look at the goal. You look at the beginning. You look at cul-de-sac. If you're present-oriented, you begin. What happens is 90% uh, uh, of the future-oriented Stanford students solve the maze, and only 60% of the present-oriented. That 30% is a hugely significant difference, and we've replicated this uh, in various ways. Uh, who smokes, takes drugs, drinks alcohol? A study of 1,200 students at Cornell and Stanford. Uh, so we hold uh, the typical scales of alcohol use. Among males at Stanford and at Cornell, it's identical. If you're present-oriented, the correlations are in the 50s. Uh, risky driving is also significant. If you're future-oriented, correlation is always negative. It's the opposite behavior. What about women? It's always been said, well, women are different than men in terms of drinking. Not if you isolate women who are present-oriented. There is no difference. Uh, so it doesn't matter whether you're at Stanford or at Cornell. The correlations are the same among men and women, and highly significant positively. And, if you, it, and the same thing is true with risky driving. So risky driving and, and alcohol use go hand in hand for present-oriented people, and it's always negative for future. Uh, let's go out in the real world. Let's look at heroin addicts. Heroin addicts are significantly higher on present hedonistic, present fatalistic, lower on future orientation, no difference on past. And those differences are significant at the 0.01 level. Guess who takes risks? These are high school students now. And take a risk driving, driving while drunk, racing your car, wearing seat, uh, seat belt. Present oriented scale, 42, 31, 37, wearing seat belts negative. And it's reversed for high school kids who are future oriented. Let's look at arousal. Present oriented kids, watch R rated movies, X rated movies, have sex, watch MTV, take risks with bikes, take skateboard tricks. And again, every case. It, with future is negative. So you have this, it doesn't matter whether it's high school, whether it's college, whether it's in the real world of, of addicts. You're getting this. And I'm saying all addictions are rooted in present orientation. And what that means is all addictions, okay, one minute to go. That's enough. Uh, conscientious, conscientious people live longer. A recent study came out last week said that a meta-analysis revealed that conscientiousness has a high significant effect on longevity. Long, uh, longevity. Well, we just saw conscientiousness correlates with future orientation 0.7. And the reason is that future orientation, uh, we, we have shown, leads to positive health behavior. Medical, bed, dental checkups, they eat healthy foods, they exercise, they wear seat belts. And it avoids risky behavior. They don't take risky behavior, buy cars, so they don't uh, seek sensation, they don't practice unsafe sex. So now we know the mechanism by which conscientiousness leads to longevity. Uh, so the optimal temporal mix is flexibly shifting between the th time zones, not to be stuck in a time zone. Uh, and so, for example, we, we now believe you want to be moderately high on the past, positive, moderately high on future, and moderate on present hedonism, and low on these two dimensions. Because the past gives you roots to connect to your identity, to your family, uh, to your tradition. The future gives you wings to sort of new challenges, new destination. And what the present does, it gives you energy. To, to do all those things. So I'm, I'm going to skip this. Uh, so uh, the connection with e economics, as you know, is Protestants in every country are more future-oriented than Catholics. Gross national product is higher in, ca in Protestant countries than Catholic countries. And it all started with the Protestant Reformation, which led to pu uh, the, a Puritan ethic. Namely, your, success on, your su likelihood to get in heaven is indexed by your success on earth. So that was a great formula for starting capitalism uh, and, uh, in Protestant countries. Einstein discovers that time is actually money. Uh, in 2002, one in 50 loans were subprime. This year, one in three. That's uh, across the whole industry. So there's a dramatic shift in people willing to take these high yield but high risk. 
And the argument is that the Wall Street meltdown is motivated by collective greed that interferes with usually wise, future-oriented, rational decision makers. And what greed does, it shifts them, at least temporarily, into being short-term present focus with quick gains, failure to discount future course against the immediate taste of the marshmallow. So it's like those four-year-old kids now extrapolated uh, into Wall Street. In a sense, it's a case of the commons dilemma uh, it, for, for the first time in terms of mass action. So I think I'd like to talk to, to Brian. Uh, uh, what we need is a study with present and future oriented people with and without induced risk temptation, uh, making economic and moral decisions with Paul, and alone or with a confederate. So this is a social psychology, where the confederate is pushing you in the direction of doing the immoral thing or the high risk thing. So I want to end by saying some of life puzzles, I think, may be solved by understanding this new way of looking at decision making, namely this, this process that we carry around that we're unaware of, this bias, this cognitive bias, this cognitive style. I don't think of it as a personality trait. It's really a cognitive style of processing information, of making decisions, namely your sense of time perspective. Thank you very much.